Welcome, friend, to Life and Liberty Radio. I'm David Householder, here to encourage your pursuit of happiness. You and our partners exploring our shared spiritual journeys. Together, we're dreaming and working for a free society. Tell others today about our adventure in faith and freedom. So breathe in, open your mind, lift up your spirit. Let's get started. So this is podcast episode number 0014. And the question we're going to ask today is this. Should we have a drinking age? Now, now, now of course, you start thinking, well, of course we should have a drinking age. You wouldn't want six-year-olds buying beer or whiskey. But what I'd like to do is reframe the question. Who should be in charge of the children? Should it be the family or the guardians? Or should it be the state? Now, we assume... Ever since the progressive movement started and really got rolling under Wilson and hit its stride under FDR, that anything we need to do, the government has to ensure it. Whereas for much of our American history, from 1620 to 1934, we had virtually no drinking age whatsoever, except in three states, and that was only later in history. Why? Because people saw, and the court saw, and the government saw, and society saw the parents and the guardians as the main protectors of the children. To have a legal drinking age is a way of saying we don't trust the parents. Now you might say, well, some parents aren't very good, so we have to make rules for everybody. But this is exactly how problems start. The truth is, in every field of human endeavor, people will make mistakes. And you can either go after the people who make mistakes, or you can make laws for everyone, which inhibits everyone's freedom, and takes away the authority from the citizen and the family, and gives it to the state, the government, the federal government, the state government, the courts, whatever. And so this has been happening now for, in earnest, for about 100 years, since the time of Wilson. And what we have to do is continue to ask the questions what should be a proper age for drinking, if drinking is good at all. And the second question is, who should be in charge of it? And in almost no cases are questions like this best answered with, the government should be in charge. How should we get safer cars? How should we get safer food? How should we get uh, safer toys? We always think, well, of course, the government should regulate that. But the truth is, government regulation for safety has almost no effect on the trend lines towards safety, which have been moving steadily for centuries in the direction of more safety. The truth is, a free market made up of free people, and you can't have free people without a free market. You really can't. Either you have economic freedom or you don't have political freedom. So when you put these things together, you have a situation which calls for a decision. Who is in charge of people's morality? Who is in charge of people's ethics? Who's in charge of the children? And if you say there's a state drinking age, then you say it's the state. The state can decide when the right time for a young person to have the right to drink would be. Well, the truth is, the state is never the best almost never the best decider of such a thing. Who knows the children better than the parents in 90 plus percent of the situations? Well, what about those bad parents? So we take away liberty for everyone for the sake of bad parents. No, that's not the right answer. The right answer is to create a free society where people can do as they wish. And in that free society, the societal control itself takes care of things within families, within communities, within neighborhoods, within churches and schools. The whole idea of a free society has been steadily disappearing for about almost exactly a 100 years. Because every time we ask a question, should this be done or should that be done, the immediate answer is the government should do it. If we have too many guns and we have shootings, which are tragic, Back in the days before 1913, before the progressive era, Lincoln would have held a day of national 
prayer and fasting. He did this often, by the way. You can look it up. And he would say, on Thursday, such and such a date, we are going to, I urge you to meet in your customary house of worship. And would you please pray for and fast for us to basically admit and repent of our sin of violence. That's what he would have done. And he would have actually led those meetings and prayers among the people that he led. And it, he would invite the American people to go at the core of the issue, totally voluntarily. But now, if there's a shooting, we need to figure out how is the government going to register and regulate everything? Because you can't trust the people. This, this is the, the message that continues to come through. You can't trust the people. Well, the truth is the Founding Fathers trusted the citizens a lot more than they trusted Caesar. And they trusted the Minutemen a lot more than they trusted the Redcoats. So either we're going to be a free society, which I think is a wonderful idea. It's still the best idea politically that human beings have ever had. I do believe it's God's plan A for us to live in a free, non-coercive society where all acts are done voluntarily. And the only time we use force is to stop someone else from using force. Never to initiate force or to to uh, go after force ahead of time because, or to go after something ahead of time because that person might commit a crime. That's exactly what we wanted to do in Iraq. We have to get rid of their weapons of mass destruction because they might have them. Well, they didn't. That preemptive strike thing, it, it didn't work for the Japanese at uh, Pearl Harbor either. That preemptive strike because they might use those weapons against us. That's never a moral act. So what we need to do is rethink and reclaim the vision of the founders. So let's look, if we could, at the history of drinking in the United States. For the trend lines behind the headlines, listen daily to The Bottom Line on KBRT in Los Angeles, KCBC in San Francisco, KBRT740.com, worldwide live streaming, California's voice for life and liberty. The 18th Amendment was passed in 1920, which prohibited alcohol use. And in 1933, the 21st Amendment, 13 years later, was the repeal of the 18th Amendment, and alcohol was once more legal in the United States. And at that point, the drinking age was 21. What was the drinking age before Prohibition in 1920? There wasn't one. You've got to be kidding. No, there really wasn't one. Did all the kids drink all the time? No. But people believed that this was a parental issue. Some parents don't believe that children should drink ever, even when they're adults, 30, 40, 50, 80 years old. There is a tradition within America of teetotaling, and it, within a teetotaling culture, it's the right of the parents to prohibit alcohol from the children and expect them to continue that through the rest of their lives. Other cultures, like the immigrant cultures of the Germans and the Irish, brought a lot of alcohol with them, and uh, alcohol use went into childhood, but it was supervised, and it was part of eating together. It was part of what people did. And so there's all of this complexity here. So the drinking age was 21, and in 1973, 1974, the 26th Amendment came through, and the voting age was lowered to 18 because of Vietnam and all of the, all of the demonstrations and all that. And so they lowered the drinking age from 21 to 18. Well, in 1984, they raised it back to 21 through the Federal Aid Highway Act. And uh, what they basically did is that every state has to raise the drinking age to 21, or we will withhold federal highway funds. So I want to understand, why does the federal government have highway funds to start with? Since the Constitution only really talks about a few postal roads and things like that, the idea that the federal government should be funding the highways is ludicrous in a country this size. We've got gigantic, crumbling highways going all over the place. Uh, stretching across states where there's no traffic. You can go through parts of Montana and Wyoming and the Dakotas who never see another car for a long period of time on gigantic four-lane autobahn and on freeways. It, it, 
it, once again, they were built for defense purposes. And that's how you always get people to spend billions is by telling them we have a threat. And so we have to build all these things. And it has to be federalized, has to be socialized. We have socialized freeways, which took over for the private enterprise railways, which would have been profitable without the monopoly of socialized freeways coming in, which brought all kinds of pollution with it. And uh, it was much greener to be on the trains because private enterprise left unchecked is always greener than public regulation and all of that stuff. Well, anyways, what happened was the drinking age then went up to 21 because the federal government said, you know, hey, uh, you can't uh, you can't get federal money unless you bring it to 21. Well, this was brought to the Supreme Court by the state of South Dakota who said, hey, let us decide what our drinking age is. And it wasn't even a matter, they said, of what the age is. It's, it, but they said it's a state issue. It's not a, it's not a federal issue. So the state of South Dakota versus Dole, 1987, Supreme Court case of the Rehnquist Court, 7-2 to two against South Dakota, saying the federal government does, too, have the right to uh, tell states what the drinking age is. And Sandra Day O'Connor, who was a friend of Ronald Reagan's, a very close friend of Ronald Reagan's from California, said, uh, you guys are out to lunch, and she formed the minority opinion and wrote a very eloquent thing saying, how dare the government tell a state that they can't have highway money if they don't put the drinking age at the age that uh, they think it should be? And (laughs) I would say, who is the federal government to take money from the states in the first place that they give back to the states and withhold? They took it from the states to start with. And then they tell them they can't have it. Well, the history of drinking in America is fascinating. In 1620, the pilgrims came over, and before that, the folks in Jamestown, and they brought lots of alcohol with them. And in 1700, we had the first distillery. Before that, we had mostly just wine and beer. And with that distillery came rum and whiskey. And there's been a a steady slide between three different terms. From temperance, which means avoiding drunkenness, to abstinence, which means never drinking, to prohibition, which means it's illegal to drink. Let me say that again. Temperance to abstinence to prohibition. And temperance usually came with these alcohol drinking cultures. There was social control called temperance. And you just say you can drink, but don't don't let it get out of control. And people generally drank together, not alone. And uh, that moved to abstinence, saying, you know, hey, maybe I won't drink. That was a matter of personal choice. But then prohibition, the choice was taken away from people. From the 1790s to the 1830s, there was heavy use of alcohol in the United States. Heavy, heavy, heavy use of alcohol. If you looked it up, you wouldn't believe it. People at work took breaks called 11s in the morning, and they would uh, have a whiskey break and often Instead of coffee, there was whiskey before breakfast. Schools even gave children whiskey breaks from time to time. And uh, that was a heavy, heavy time of alcohol use from the 1790s to 1830. Uh, Just massive quantities of alcohol were drank all over the United States. And the 1791 Whiskey Rebellion was a result of the government saying, hey, there's so much alcohol use, let's make a lot of money off of this. And the folks in Pennsylvania said, uh, no, no, we're not going to do that. And so they started forming organized crime bands, which uh, exist to this day in the forms of drug cartels and everything else. This was the first organized crime in the United States, which was widespread. In the earlier 1800s, the German and Irish immigrants came en masse. They came in large, large numbers of millions and millions, and they brought with them uh, alcohol-friendly culture. So they added that to the American love for alcohol, which was already there. And people started looking at the Germans and the Irish. And in 1808, they started saying, hey, uh, we need to form a temperance society because uh, these German and Irish immigrants are out of control. And so it was basically a a, a thing that was focused on the the Methodists. And it was anti-immigrant, it was anti-slavery, which is interesting, abolitionist, and it was feminist. It was a suffrage movement. So the anti-immigrant folks formed an alliance with the anti-slavery folks, the prohibitionists, and uh, the prohibitionists of alcohol, and uh, those who wanted to emancipate the slaves, and the suffrage people that wanted women to vote, and give women the vote. And so there was all of this sort of co- 